Welcome back to The Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay. We're continuing our series on the book, 23 Things They Don't Tell You About Capitalism. And we're up to thing 10. Thing 10 is, the U.S. does not have the highest living standard in the world. Well, most people think it does. So, yes, uh, so what's the story here? Well, uh, you know, the, this idea that the U.S. is... Number one. Yeah, number one. I mean, has uh, persuaded a lot of people that, well, if we want to be like them, we need to adopt American-style free market capitalism. But actually, uh, when you look at uh, the numbers uh, closely, it actually the story is uh, a lot more complicated. Now, just uh, look at the published dollar income. Actually, the U.S. isn't the richest country anymore. I mean, Norway has far higher per capita income than the U.S. and six or seven other European countries. But uh, economists uh, that to reflect uh, the local differences in labor costs and so on have introduced this idea of purchasing power parity, which basically tells you how much uh, you can buy in different countries with the same dollar of your money. And when you use that uh, the purchasing power parity income, it turns out that the United States, except for Luxembourg with, say, 400,000 people, the United States has uh, the highest purchasing power parity income per capita. So the, a lot of people on that basis say, well, this is you know, still the best country. But one thing that we all have to remember is that the Americans work much longer than people in other comparably rich countries. You know? Depending on which country you compare it with, Americans uh, work 10 to 30 percent longer than the people in you know, France, so this is Sweden, and so on. Longer hours in a day, uh, yeah. less vacation exactly, time. Exactly, yeah. So the, the annual total you know, working hours, say. So if, if, you take, if you take a more holistic view of standard of living, what do you get? Yeah, if you use that measure, even in purchasing power parity terms, the United States is only about seventh or eighth richest country in the world. So per hour's work, actually countries like uh, France and so on have a much higher income. I mean, they have more le leisure time, which uh, adds to their quality of living. So uh, you may even argue that, that uh, the difference is actually even bigger than what is indicated by simply comparing purchasing power parity income. And of course, uh, let's not forget that the United States is far more unequal than other comparably yeah, because rich if you're countries. Talking, if you're talking standard of living in the United States, is the world of people with health care, the world of exactly, people without yeah. health care. Exactly, yeah. So the, the average number, of course, the average number nowhere gives you the whole picture. but the average number in the U.S. is even more distorted than the average numbers give, in give other us a, Give us a couple of outstanding examples. Though. Yes, I mean, the, having the, you know, unequal coverage of uh, the Social Security, including health care, I mean, the Americans are, the, are spending actually far more money on health care, but uh, they have apparently no the better health indicators. I mean, America the, spends 13, 14 percent of GDP on health care, Countries like uh, Sweden spend uh, less than 10 percent. The Swedes have uh, higher health uh, standards. Eh? I mean, uh, judged in terms of life expectancy and so on. The U.S. is a very unequal society. It has a much higher crime rate on per capita basis. The United States have 12 times more people in prison than Japan. Eight times more people in the prison than European countries. So this is the consequence uh, of you know, unequal uh, society. Well, in that respect, the U.S. is number one. Yes. <laughs> well, right. you have to be number one in something. <laughs> one in something, yeah. <laughs> okay, we're going to move on. Uh -huh. All right. Number 11, Africa is not destined for underdevelopment. Yes, uh, a lot of people have recently argued that, look, uh, Africa has this, uh, I mean, what they call growth tragedy. In the last 30 years, it basically has not grown at all on per capita basis. Yeah? So the living standard has been stagnant for the last 30 years. And they try to explain this by the fact that Africa has a poor climate, which creates, say, tropical diseases, yeah? bad geography in the sense that a lot of them are landlocked, and therefore make, it, it, makes, it is difficult for them to trade with the outside world. I mean, uh, they, they talk about uh, they, the African countries having too much uh, ethnic diversity, which uh, leads to a lot of conflict and so on. So they try to explain this as uh, the, 
you know, sort of structural outcome. You know? Africa is destined not to develop because they have bad geography, bad Okay, climate. so what's wrong with that? Well, the, the problem is that uh, you know, a lot of these things are actually the, if you like, consequences rather than the causes of underdevelopment. You know, I mean, just think about it, that the same Richter scale seven earthquake hits uh, Haiti, you have uh, 200,000 people dead. The same kind of uh, earthquake hits uh, Mexico, probably you have uh, 20,000 uh, dead people. That same earthquake hits Japan, uh, two people die. Yeah? So actually the, the suffering from natural conditions is uh, the consequence rather than the causes of underdevelopment. You know, I mean, it's not as if uh, the rich countries uh, the, do not have uh, actually the, the, uh, those uh, structural constraints. It's like healthcare. Uh, tuberculosis, if you're poor, you die. Exactly. Tuberculosis, yeah. if you're rich, you live. That's well, right, yeah. And, uh, you know, I mean, just, just think about it. I mean, even being landlocked, you know, I mean, the, the two richest, con the two of the richest countries in the world, Switzerland and Austria, are landlocked, yeah? Of course, uh, when I say that, uh, people point out, oh, but uh, they have good river navigation system that uh, link them to the outside world. A lot of African countries have uh, very good river systems. It's only that they don't have the money to develop it. Well, that's, that's the real thing. The amount of uh, capital investment in Africa is minuscule compared to the population. On the other hand, the natural resources of Africa perhaps surpass the rest of the globe. Yeah, well, I mean, I don't know about uh, the latter point. I mean, I'm not uh, actually sure that uh, they have uh, better natural resources in Durban. I mean, no, in terms of un unexploited natural resources, right, unexploited, I think. Unexploited, yes, yeah. yes, yeah. Uh, that, that's true. But yes, I mean, that, uh, that's exactly my point. I mean, all those so-called structural constraints look like uh, structural constraints uh, only because you haven't got the ability to overcome those things. Yeah? So, I mean, uh, then the But how, why, how does that change, though? Well, I mean, you have to uh, get the economy moving. I mean, have to generate uh, investment, uh, have to develop infrastructure, have to develop uh, production capacities. And all of those things have become actually more difficult in the last 30 years in Africa because they have been put under all these programs administered by the IMF and the World Bank, which actually discourage uh, these countries from doing those things. Yeah, I mean, it's a combination. In the first years after World War II, you have the Cold War put in kleptocracies and dictators because mm -hmm. the only issue that the West cared about in Africa, that there wouldn't be national liberation movements that somehow would be allied yeah. with socialism. And now you have the IMF and structural adjustment yeah. policies. No, but uh, you know, the, the, what is even more sad is the fact that uh, even in the, the, those uh, days of uh, the I mean, U.S. supported uh, the puppet governments and so on. In the 1950s and 60s, Africa actually was able to grow quite decently. I mean, the, the, in the 60s and 70s, African countries uh, grew at about 1.5, 1.6 percent per year in per capita terms. Yeah? In the last uh, 30 years, uh, the growth rate has fallen to 0.2 percent. And the reason is because uh, the, in the 60s and 70s, uh, Americans were not so insistent on these countries using free trade, free market policies. Mm -hmm. So I would uh, argue that a lot of uh, the growth uh, problems in Africa should be actually attributed to those things because if anything, those uh, structural constraints should have been even more severe in the old days. Eh? Mm -hmm. Okay, let's do one more in this segment. Mm -hmm. 23 things, we're up to 12. Governments can pick winners. Yes, I mean, uh, there's this uh, widespread uh, belief that government cannot pick winners. Yeah? I mean, uh, they just don't know what's going on in the business world. How do you expect these people to you know, be able to support, uh, sorry, uh, choose uh, particular industries that might be a winner in the long run? First of all, against this argument, uh, I point out in the book that uh, there are many, many examples where the government successfully picked winners. Yeah? For, now, exa for example? Yes, I mean, uh, for example, the, in the late 1960s, the South Korean government set up this uh, state-owned enterprise in the steel, which is uh, known as uh, POSCO, now it's a pro uh, privatized company, but uh, it uh, set up this uh, state-owned steel company against the advice of the World Bank, against uh, the advice of uh, <laughs> just about everyone, 
because it uh, believed that uh, a good industrialization program requires a good, efficient steel producer, and it was a huge success. Yeah? I mean, but in the beginning, everyone thought that this was crazy. Yeah? In Japan, in the 1950s, when the Japanese government was uh, trying to promote the uh, automobile industry, I mean, Americans laughed. You know? what, what are you doing? I mean, you are a country that uh, basically exporting cheap toys and uh, T-shirts, and you are trying to compete with us building cars. You know, that was a time when uh, America that, that produced something like uh, 7 million cars in a year, and Japan produced uh, something like uh, 70,000 cars. I mean, I forget the exact number, but, you know, but uh, the Japanese government said, that unless uh, you have uh, industries like automobile, uh, you are not going to uh, become a rich country. We have to support this uh, through tariff protection, subsidies, and uh, all sorts of other government uh, measures. So there actually have been a lot of uh, success uh, stories of uh, government picking In China winners. too, no? Yeah, China is uh, full of those. I Which mean, is, I find kind of ironic, uh, is that some of the same people that keep talking about we need to learn from what China's doing and look at what China's doing, uh, you, they say, oh, no, no, but government can't pick winners yeah, you know, here. I mean, right? I'll tell you another beautiful story. I mean, uh, Singapore Airline, which is uh, one of the most uh, kind of, uh, highly rated uh, airline companies in the world, is actually a fully state-owned enterprise. Mm -hmm. huh? In the, the nearly 40 years of its uh, operation, it has uh, never made one penny of loss. Yeah? In contrast, all the free enterprise American airline companies live on government subsidies. Huh? And they spend half their time eating each other for breakfast. Uh, exactly, yeah. Uh, so they're the, far people, more worried about mergers than flying. That's right. So these people actually use these uh, the things uh, to justify yeah, whatever is uh, convenient for them. You know, I mean, that, that I just I think uh, this argument that government uh, that, uh, is always uh, that unsuccessful and the private sector always uh, is successful. Well, here's one of the arguments uh, on that, though, is mm -hmm. that because of the influence that certain sectors of capital have over government, mm -hmm. especially in the United States, that the uh, government will pick winners that are good for the people of that who are their yeah, yeah, financial there's backers. A, yeah, there's a, that uh, political words, capture it's issue, but it's mm -hmm. a political issue. It's not inherent in the government policy, you know, I mean, the, and especially in these days uh, when yeah, half the U.S. Uh, financial companies are, I mean, that should have been technically bankrupt uh, without this uh, bailout, someone saying that private sector well, is uh, better at picking winners, I mean, it's uh, laughable. And aren't they picking winners with the banks, is Exactly. Point, obviously, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but uh, of course, uh, there's that uh, political issue, yeah, the bankers uh, have uh, captured uh, the U.S. government, and yeah, they, they are that, that putting pressure on the, the government to do things uh, that suit them rather than the national interest. Eh? So join us for the next segment of 23 Things They Don't Tell You About Capitalism. And we're going to be talking about the idea that making the rich richer makes everybody else richer. Or does it? Thanks for joining us on The Real News Network.